Hey there, Derek. Oh, hey, Jimmy. What's wrong, buddy? Nothing. It's okay. You can tell me, man. Yeah, well, you see, it's, it's this game. Oh, game troubles, is it? Jimmy, have you ever wanted to like a game, but, you know, it just never seems to work out no matter what you do? Yeah, I've been down that road a time or two. I'll tell you what, maybe I can help. Really? You do that? Of course. Tell me a little bit about it. What's the name? The Grand Stream Saga. Developed by Shade and published by THQ, the Grandstream Saga was released on the original PlayStation in 1997. Between the generic name, no-name developer, and, let's face it, poor-name publisher, I'm not sure I know of a less interesting combination of words. But if you're still awake, it might interest you to know that the game was one of the first fully polygonal RPGs ever made. And in fact, it debuted at number one on the sales charts in Japan, dethroning the long-standing Final Fantasy VII. But when the game made it to the United States, its reviews were lackluster, perhaps due to the year-long localization process taking some of its thunder from the game's technical achievements. Despite this, the Grandstream Saga was a game that I had been looking forward to trying out for quite some time, and Admittedly, my hopes were probably higher than they should have been. After all, nobody's ever heard of the developer Shade before, and it's not like I should expect anything from them on the caliber of something like, say, Terranigma, right? Well, you're half right. Certainly Shade didn't have the coffers of a producer like Enix or Nintendo to draw from, but in a previous life, Shade was known as Quintet. And if you squint and turn your head like so, you might recognize the telltale signs that you're actually playing the final entry in the Soul Blazer series. After Terranigma was released in PAL territories, Quintet and Enix went their separate ways. After all, Enix was getting out of the localization business for a while, and what with the shift to the 32-bit era, this wasn't an uncommon occurrence. The transition to 3D polygonal models was a pioneering time, an uncertain time. Not many developers had worked with 3D before, and a lot of projects suffered because of this. So with their own future uncertain, Koji Yokoda of Quintet created his own private development company, taking many of the developers of Quintet with him, including series veteran Tomiyashi Miyazaki. And thus, Shade was born with Yokota calling the shots as director and Miyazaki's inexperience with 3D design, Miyazaki's role was diminished to scenario writing. There were also some rumors that the Grandstream Saga was based off of a popular manga series named Kross, but I can't find any evidence to substantiate that such a manga even ever existed. In the Grandstream Saga, you play as a teenaged saint named Eon. He was found as a baby wearing a scepter on his arm, which later plays a pivotal role in the game as he begins to understand and harness its power. As it turns out, Eon lives on a floating island in the sky which is kept afloat along with three other islands by magic cast a hundred years ago after the world was submerged during a great war. Unfortunately, as we come to learn, these islands are sinking and a ritual must be performed in order to prevent these islands from falling into the briny depths below. So it would appear as though all of the basic elements of a Soul Blazer title are present and accounted for. Restoring a post-apocalyptic world and the themes of death and resurrection come into play towards the end of the game. And as usual for a Soul Blazer title, quite a few of the main cast die along the way. 
On paper, it looks like we've got everything that we need. But there's one thing that this game is missing. Oh, I, I know what you're thinking. The graphics, right? Wrong. Sure, I've gone on record before stating that I'm not a fan of the early 3D work found on the PlayStation, but the fact of the matter is that these graphics were a product of the times. This was revolutionary, in fact. Sure, the graphics of Terra Enigma may have been near the pinnacle of the Super Nintendo's capabilities, and yeah, going from that to the Grandstream Saga is pretty jarring, but I can't bring myself to knock this game for that reason. But no, what this game is missing is finesse, nuance. The Grandstream Saga is dull, it's boring, and mired in tedium. This is the kind of thing that shouldn't have been affected by a change in graphics style. Pacing, story progression, and the nature of side quests, the leveling system, everything is just so sloppy. It's cheap and sloppy and completely unbecoming of a company that I know knew better. In my last review, I said that Quintet games charm me, but this game isn't charming. It's barely even interesting until the last hour or two of the game. Not helping their case at all is that every character in this game is an anime archetype. Eon is your typical hero who couldn't hurt a fly. Arcia is a naive shrine maiden minus the shrine, and Laramie is just a typical Tsundere character. You know, the girl who acts all strong-willed and abrasive but is secretly a soft and tender flower. You know the type. Well, this is our trio, and their interactions write themselves, making every bit of dialogue completely predictable. Now I don't know how much was lost in translation, at least a little bit to be sure. I would love to blame everything on THQ though. Maybe the Japanese version of the game gives you better reasons for having to play telephone to progress the plot. Maybe the puzzles aren't made as obvious in the Japanese version. And maybe the characters had actual personalities. Surely something happened during localization because it scored much better in Japan than it did here. I would like to be able to say that this was a fantastic game that was ruined by THQ, but part of me isn't sure. The same part of me that hates that battles are boring one-on-one -on -one fights that serve no purpose but to slow your own progression. They don't provide experience points so you can just skip them all without any consequence. Instead, you level up at predetermined plot points. In fact, enemies could be entirely removed from the game, and it would have just barely, minimally affected the story of the game. Whoa, hold on there, buddy. I said I'd help you with the review, but I didn't mean I'd help you take it out by the lake and talk about tending the rabbits and all that. I think you're being a bit too hard on this game. Maybe your expectations were too high after coming down from playthroughs of classics like Illusion of Gaia and Terra Enigma. The first time I played the Grand Stream Saga, I had high expectations as well. When I was only 13 years old, I discovered a promotional video of the game in an official US PlayStation Magazine demo disc, and would literally watch it several times a day in anticipation of its release. I will admit the game did fall a little short of my lofty expectations, but I really enjoyed my experience with the Grand Stream Saga, and it easily became one of my favorite titles on the PS1. And I felt this way after completing playthroughs of some of the system's best role-playing offerings, such as Final Fantasy VII, Wild Arms, Vandal Hearts, and possibly my all-time favorite RPG, Suikoden. Replaying the game for the first time in over 15 years and as a grown-ass man has allowed me to judge it more objectively. And I agree with a lot of your grievances, Derek. But... I still think the Grandstream Saga is a fantastic game that fans of Quintet's work, Japanese RPGs, or gaming in general should give a fair shot. The dungeons and puzzles aren't as well designed as those in the Soul Blazer series, but that's not really the focus of the game. The Grandstream Saga is an action RPG with heavy emphasis on the action part, and you can tell Shade put quite a bit of effort into developing the battle system, which rewards skill over grinding. Combat is satisfying, and there are a variety of different enemy types with ruthless AI which prevent battles from ever drifting into button-mashing territory. 
for the most part. There are a lot of options available to suit a variety of playstyles, and the action feels like an overhead 3D fighting game. If you just can't get used to the battle system or find the fights too tedious, a majority of the enemies in the game can be ran past completely, cutting down on the frustration and wasted time found in most RPGs that came before this, and even after. Dialogue is less than stellar, and emotions aren't really conveyed the way they should be in the sometimes soulless or oddly worded text bubbles that pop up on screen. THQ probably does play a big part in somewhat botching the localization. I mean, at the time the company did start bringing out more Japanese games to North America, but never had experience with tackling an RPG. That abomination doesn't count. I feel they approached the source material and went about marketing this game in a completely misguided way. Something like, Hey you gaming sexual Tyrannosaurus. Just got done playing Final Fantasy VII. Going through Tifa withdrawals. Well then, THQ has got the game to satisfy all your role-playing needs and desires. Debuted at number one in Japan. And you know, they know how to do fan service. Let the girls of Grand Stream Saga accompany you on the fantasy adventure of a lifetime. Oh, and boobs. Anyway, the graphics are primitive by today's standards, and certainly don't measure up to the gorgeous 2D sprite-based games of the era. But just as I think the simple and arguably ugly 2D graphics of the NES are appealing today, I hold early 3D games of this time period in similar esteem. Everything is bright and colorful, and the art design is really cool and well done in my opinion, if not a bit repetitive or bland at some times. And come on, these derp-faced dragons are sure to put a smile on anyone's face. Even yours, Derek. Maybe I'm wearing my thickest pair of rose-tinted glasses here. Or maybe I'm going full Ezero. But even with the negative aspects of the graphics, story, and game design, I personally find the game charming, and the awkwardness and bad parts add to the charm. One area I think the Grand Stream Saga absolutely excels at is the music department. I would even say the score is about on par with Terranigmas, which makes sense, as both games' soundtracks were done by mostly the same people. And unlike a lot of RPGs on the PlayStation, you're not going to have to sell your kidney on the black market to be able to afford this game, as it's one of the cheapest on the system, even complete in box. Oh, gee. Thanks, Jimmy. I think you've really helped me out a lot. No problem, my man. Anytime. So anyway, after all this, what do you say? Is the Grand Stream Saga going to be a part of the game collection? Hmm. Nah. Great. Wait, what? I'm afraid I can't let you do that, Derek. Alright, well, thanks. Good you talking to you, You can't do that. Jamie. Stop! What about the boobs? <laughs>